I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, just a few hours from here. Baltimore has always been known for two things, crabs and lacrosse. In fact, until relatively recently, Baltimore was the center of the lacrosse playing universe. Although it's true, as Mr. Yinger told you in his chapel talk earlier this winter, that the Baltimore Orioles are a big deal, Baltimore kids simply don't play baseball in the spring. They play lacrosse. As a result, I started playing at age seven, continued playing in high school and college, and coached high school lacrosse until arriving at Hill eight years ago. To this day, lacrosse is responsible for many of my closest friends, best memories, a very meaningful portion of my career, and enduring life lessons. There was a moment, however, when all of that almost didn't happen. Now, compared to the typical high school lacrosse player, I was on the big side, especially for a goalie. The combination of my size and a goalie's deep pocket made it difficult for defenders to check the ball out of my stick. So I often would run the ball downfield by myself and even try to score on the opposing goalie, much to my coach's chagrin. After making the first save of my first game of my senior year season, I took off running with the ball. And about halfway up the field, I planted my right foot on a small imperfection in the grass. There was a loud popping sound as my knee buckled and I collapsed to the ground in excruciating pain. Moments later, our athletic trainer, and days later, my orthopedic surgeon, informed me that my lacrosse season and likely my entire athletic career was over. For the first time in my otherwise privileged life, I felt true loss and I wept. Everything I had worked for, everything that had defined me, everything that I had looked forward to as long as I could remember was taken away from me in an instant. What's worse, that team went on to win the league championship and the backup goalie would be named the team MVP. To me, at least at the time, it was as if my very deep and overwhelming loss was inconsequential to the team and even to the rest of the world, for that matter. It has taken me nearly 30 years to fully appreciate the exceptionally positive impact that otherwise devastating moment had on my life. First of all, instead of playing lacrosse that spring, I threw myself into a filmmaking class. I met classmates who would not likely have been in my social circles and made lifelong friends in the process, including fifth former Audrey Lennis's father, Walt, who was one of my filmmaking partners. Furthermore, through filmmaking, I discovered creative talents and a passion for the arts that I had been overlooking my entire life. My father was a highly successful museum director, and I was the proverbial shoemaker's son who never wore shoes. I went on to study film and animation in college, win a Student Academy Award, teach filmmaking, and perhaps most importantly, make amusing video parodies to keep high school students entertained. Second, since I had my afternoons free, I asked my high school principal to let me produce and direct Children of a Lesser God that spring, a play that tells the love story between a deaf janitor and a hearing English teacher at a school for the deaf. While this experience certainly expanded my artistic repertoire, it actually was my first true advocacy, leadership, and teaching experience. First, I had to persuade the school to approve a student production of that magnitude. I had to raise money to hire and then recruit a professional deaf actress and sign language instructor. I had to design and build the sets, organize rehearsals, and much more. Needless to say, I've put those transferable skills to work in the 30 years hence. And lastly, after reconstructive surgery, I spent countless hours rehabilitating my knee and committing myself to playing sports again. Arthroscopic knee surgery was much less advanced in those days and the recovery periods were much longer. Nevertheless, I was back on the field playing college football six months later and continued my lacrosse career both in college and beyond. 
From that initial injury and three subsequent surgeries on my knee and back, I developed a sense of resilience, grit, and intensity that has served me very well over the years. And while that relentlessness can be exasperating to others at times, as some of my colleagues and family members may attest, I am blessed with a gift of unswerving optimism. Every cloud has a silver lining. This well-worn expression originates from John Milton's 1634 poem called Comus, wherein he writes, I did not err, there does a sable cloud turn forth her silver lining on the night and casts a gleam over this tufted grove. As you may recall from my opening remarks at the beginning of this school year, you represent our most geographically diverse student body in the Hill School's 169-year history. Yet, even though the clouds may today seem dark above all 32 states and 32 countries to which we temporarily have retreated, I believe their silver linings will cast a gleam over each of us and our community. What are our silver linings? Perhaps that's unclear to you today, and it may take you 30 years to gain a perspective, but here's what I'm banking on. Since your teachers are adjusting their curriculum and teaching methods, you are going to learn new things in new ways. That's a silver lining. Since much of your classwork will be asynchronous, you are going to develop time management skills and self-discipline. With most of your family living and working under one roof for a while, you will acquire newfound patience and flexibility. You will improve your writing and communication skills, and you will also learn to be a better listener. You will acquire healthier habits around hygiene, exercise, and nutrition that will improve your quality of life for many years to come. You will have time to read, play, and connect with friends and loved ones in ways that you may not have had time for before. While studying humanities, you also will be studying humanity. These next weeks and months will be a real-time case study in science, politics, collaboration, leadership, faith, economics, and psychology. You will be able to binge watch every show imaginable. And you will sleep, probably a lot. Enough already, Mr. Lehman, we get it. We know we're fortunate. We know it could be much worse. We know that previous generations have been called to fight wars and make real sacrifices. And last but not least, we know that we're so lucky to have the internet so we can stay busy and connected. The silver linings you described are great and all, but this really stinks. Yes, it's lousy. It's unfair. I couldn't agree more. And I don't have any magic words or magic wands to make it better, but you do. You can be creative. You can demonstrate leadership and you can be an optimist. You can cast a gleam over this tufted grove. Good luck, Godspeed, and good health as we embark upon this new journey together. Thank you.